So today, um, the 1816 Farmington Quaker Meeting House. So the, the Friends, um, going all the way back to 1810, maybe before, um, there were two centers. There was Farmington and there was Scipio. And they called it the Scipio Farmington Yearly Meeting. And they, um, uh, they were two hotbeds of uh, progressive uh, reform. And, the, um, uh, and so we have a kinship. And the, uh, we also have a kinship in that uh, we, start, we, have, uh, we started out with two derelict buildings. Their building is still, uh, still in process. <laughs> And so we. And we, ours looks worse than yours ever did. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I'd be interested to hear about that. <laughs> yeah. So, um, so they're gonna. Uh, so Judy and Dave, Dave Runix is here, and they're gonna talk about their project. And um, um, so looking forward to it. Thank you all for being here. It's wonderful to see you, and. Um, you know, it's not about me or Dave or you. I always say we always work for the people in the past. Our goal is to let their voices be heard as well as we can and to learn from them, especially in today's world where things seem so um, divided amongst the people in the country. It's really affirming and energizing for me to know that there is a tradition in this country that's strong and persistent about really respecting everyone and including everyone and working for justice and fairness. And it just so happens that Sherwood was one hot spot of that in upstate New York and Farmington was another one. We have the Farmington Quaker Crossroads Historic District that matches, uh, kind of balances the Sherwood Equal Rights District. So those are the two groups. and. It's wonderful to be able to talk about it. And as Larry said, this I did see this building when it was in terrible shape. In fact, we had a meeting. I actually I, I recorded it. Did any of you to, to get the recording I just sent last week? I was looking for stuff. It was in the Scipio Church. And I remember people were saying, oh, we have to tear it down. It's just, you know, put up, you know, whatever. And Chris Capella Peters from the State Historic Preservation Office said, well, I'm not in the business of tearing it down, but I could tell you how you could restore at least part of it. And that's, look what's happened. It's absolutely gorgeous and what an inspiration to all of us. I mean, this is, it's wonderful to come here and see everything you've done and know it's possible. So we're going to do a, a quick overview of this building and why it was important, why it, no one's in such good repair and what people are doing here today to bring it back to life to become a parallel interpretive center to this one. And uh, Carrie Magnin is here, who's our co-chair of our program committee, and Lyle Jenks is here, who is on our Farmington group, and Dave Brunix and I are all here from Farmington, and there are actually were a couple of people we're going to listen to. I don't know if they did or not. Um, this is dedicated to all of us because as we know, as you know, as we know, it's not easy to save these buildings and turn them into something that actually works for people. And I'm just in such admiration of everybody who's committed to this and who's really devoted our lives for the last 25 years to doing this kind of work. So thank you all. And there have been lots of volunteers who worked especially on the Farmington project, and these are some of them that actually funded some of this and did some of the research and helped with it. Um, this is the Farmington Quaker Meeting House in 1892. Mm -hmm. The photograph is taken, it was glass plate negatives taken by a local Quaker, Edwin Gardner. This is what it looked like oh in 2007. Wow. Now, if I were going to take a vote, even from partisan people who think this place looked terrible, wouldn't you agree this looks worse than <laughs> this? I mean, it's really so <laughs> Lyle came from wherever you came from, Philadelphia then, right. about this time, and he, and he actually found some money from the Chase Fund for helping with this. So. We know that um, 
it's an inspirational vision, and people who saw it then really had a vision that not everyone could see. <laughs> and uh, this is a group of local people uh, that we got together and did a This Place Matters one. Um, because it is so nationally important as we looked at all the important um, activists for the Underground Railroad and abolitionism for women's rights and for Seneca Indian land rights, it was like an amazing, it's almost all roads lead to Farmington as we've been finding out. So what is the background in this country for equal rights? Why is this meeting house so important? What happened to lead to such an awful condition for it? And how are we working to make it become something that's really useful and attractive for people today? Equality is built into this country's founding documents. You probably all are so familiar with the preamble to the Declaration of Independence that all men are created equal. Or if you went to Seneca Falls, you'd say all men and women are created equal, that we're endowed by our creator with certain inalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. We never quite reach that as Americans, but we're always aiming for that kind of goal. And for Quakers especially, that ideal of equality is built into a kind of spiritual vision and some of them often quote in Galatians, in Christ there's neither Jew nor Greek, slave nor free, male nor female, or George Fox walks cheerfully over the earth, answering that of God and everyone. And based on that core belief, Quakers, all out of proportion to their numbers, work to implement these ideals of equal rights, not just for one person here or one group there, but for everyone across the board immediately. And that's what was incorporated in both the Sherwood vision and the Farmington vision. In upstate New York, before the Civil War, these two places became hot spots. Not the only hot spots, there were many others, but particularly important and uh, nationally important uh, places of reform. So why was this building important? Well. It was a traditional Quaker meeting house with two front doors, broadside to the street. This pattern grew up uh, beginning in, I think, Buckingham meeting in Philadelphia, in Pennsylvania, in the mid-18th century to reflect the equality or at least the ability of women to meet separately to make their own decisions and men to meet separately and make their own decisions, hence the two front doors and the traditional ones had dividers down the middle, which Ours does, none of them are dividers. They were all taken off and made into a little uh, building, uh, a little room upstairs, but we have all the pieces as far as we know. And its history makes it important. It, it, as you can see, the physical building needs a lot of work. <laughs> but uh, this became the cent a center of Hicksite organizing, and it organized a separate Hicksite, if you're familiar with the Hicksite Orthodox split, in 1828, some Quakers really, um, they were biblically oriented, believing in Jesus Christ as a savior, his death on the cross as the important part of his life. Hicksites, and, that, and that's incorporated in Poplar Ridge, in the Farmington Friends. There, I think there are four meetings today that descend from that tradition. And uh, their meeting houses all have broad gable end to the streets instead of this broad side to the street. So it's reflected, the ideals are reflected in different architectural styles. But um, Farmington was, um, they formed in 1834 a separate yearly meeting. Quakers meet yearly. There were 25 monthly meetings in upstate New York and in Canada that formed the 25 meetings that came every year in June to the Farmington Meeting House as part of the six site tradition. So it became a transnational meeting, which is one of the things that helped it with its Underground Railroad issues. And upstate New York was so impacted by ideals of revivalism, religious revivalism and reform that some people call it the burned over district or Carl Carver calls it a psychic highway. And you can kind of see that both um, Sherwood and Farmington are kind of right in the middle of that immense movements. And those 
of religious ideals and the changing economic and social openness created an, an atmosphere that made it really possible to think about what do we want to make this country, what is our vision for creating an American democratic republic? And many people argue we should be thinking about the ideals of the Declaration of Independence. We should be working for equal rights for all people. And particularly in these two groups, it was for women's rights, African American rights, and Seneca Indian land rights. So let's take a look at each of those particular movements just really quickly. Um, Native Americans, Seneca people, and Haudenosaunee people in general, faced tremendous pressure from dominant culture, European Americans taking over their lands, often in um, really inappropriate and dishonest ways by the state of New York after the Revolutionary War. The federal government, some of you may know about the Trail of Tears that moved all the southeastern peoples, the Cherokee, the Choctaw, uh, the Chickasaw, etc., west to what's now Oklahoma, where they still are a major nation um, presence. In 1835 and 6, the federal government thought that was such a good idea that they sent the same negotiator, John Skirmerhorn, who was a Dutch reform minister from Schenectady, and said, do the same thing with the Haudenosaunee people. We want to get rid of all of them. We want to move them all to Kansas. Hmm. Well, Seneca's refused to leave. The idea was, and the treaty said, <clears throat> that this will not go into effect without the approval of each of the nations in council assembled. Seneca's never approved. They said, we're not leaving. And they came to Farmington. Um, the Tonawandas actually asked for a meeting at Farmington. And they met at Farmington in 1840. Um, and Quakers organized a support network that included representatives from um, annual meetings of Baltimore, Philadelphia, New York, and Genesee yearly meeting of friends. And with Seneca people, they organized a national movement of resistance. The, they hired Griffith Cooper, whose house is still standing in Williamson, where Dave was teaching. And William Burling from Canandaigua was very active from this area as well. Um, at the conference at Farmington, um, five Seneca leaders came and made their case and asked for help. And uh, this man, Jimmy Johnson, who was, uh, the Seneca's like Quakers are splitting apart in this period. Some are Christianized, Westernized, some are trying to maintain the clan mother system and the guide away all the handsome lake. So Tom, Jimmy Johnson is the head of the traditionalists, the pagans as they were often called. Um, but he was the one who actually asked for help. He didn't speak at that meeting. But this is a petition we only ask for justice. We love Tonawanda. We've no wish to leave it. It's the land of our fathers. Here we wish to lay our bones in peace. It is heart-wrenching, the uh, appeal that they made. And Quakers responded. Griffith Cooper said, we pulled the strings and the world, world's people danced. And one of the things they did, they visited the president, the secretary of war, the governor of New York State, William Seward, who was very sympathetic to, this, to the Senecas and the Haudenosaunee, the governor of Massachusetts. They organized a petition campaign, and a lot of the petitions are still in the National Archives. People in Sherwood signed one, people in Farmington signed one, people in Rush signed one. We, we don't even know how many people actually signed these petitions in support of the Seneca Indians. And they interviewed all the Seneca people. Um, this document says, published in 1840, it is a knock your socks off story, and it's online if you'd like to read it. I mean, it just, uh, it's unbelievable. So it says 15 sixteenths of the Senecas didn't want to go west. And I'm thinking, I'm you know, kind of skeptical. How did they know 15 sixteenths? Well, we found papers at Swarthmore College kept by this joint committee that list the name of every woman, every man, and how many kids lived in their household, 
And they said, do you want to go or do you want to stay? And they checked it off. They counted every person, chiefs, warriors, and, uh, and women. Those were the three categories. That's how they know that 15, 16s didn't want to go. I mean, it's Quakers are nothing if not good record keepers. But <laughs> this was like a, unbelievable. Um, the result was the Compromise Treaty of 1842, by which the Senecas kept Allegheny and Cattaraugus. They lost Buffalo Creek entirely. The Tonawandas refused to leave and made a separate deal in 1857. But that's why there is any that that Haudenosaunee people today have any remnant of their homeland still under their control. And it, this is a story, the Trail of Tears has often been written about. This is a story that's barely been told. And we're organizing, actually, a transcription project to take some of those records and see if we can begin to get them out to the public so people are much more aware of what was happening. We're working with people at Ganondagan and with uh, Becky Bowen, who's the Seneca Nation archivist, to see what we can do. African Americans and the Underground Railroad and abolitionism also found a home not in Farmington as they did in Sherwood. Uh, Francis Chesborough, who was just a kid in Canandaigua at the time, remembered that Farmington, a Quaker settlement, is the direct road of the Underground Railroad leading into Canada. And these were some of the people involved. The first person we know of that actually came escaping from slavery on the Underground Railroad was Austin Stewart. And he wrote an autobiography, um, 22 Years a Slave and 40 Years a Free Man. Again, it's online if you'd like to read it. It's really interesting. But he says, and it's almost a Quaker-like uh, vision, I came to the conclusion that God created all men free and equal and placed them upon this earth to do good and benefit each other and that war and slavery should be banished from the face of the earth. Um, <clears throat> we have a extensive uh, programming every year, so we try to do it around these themes and to get, this is David Anderson talking about Austin Stewart several years ago. Frederick Douglass often came to Farmington and he writes in his 1892 autobiography about what it meant to him to go around to these dominant culture white communities and to be invited to speak at these local churches and at these anti-slavery fairs. He says, it's the best school possible for me. I had to think and read. I had to express myself clearly. And he'd go home and write up the speech he'd just given in, in Victor Farmington, Canada, Geneva, Waterloo, wherever, and put it as an editorial in the North Star. So it became a national and international audience, what he was talking about. One of the families <clears throat> in Farmington that was most supportive of Frederick Douglass was the Hathaway family. They did have a safe house. There's a story. Uh, J.C. Hathaway wrote a letter to the National Anti-Slavery Standard in 1842 about a young man who had come from Virginia to his house. They'd invited him to stay overnight. And he said, I'm not going to stay overnight. I was, um, my, my master bet me in a cockfight and lost. I'm not staying one more night in any country where my life is worth less than a chicken's. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, and he was, J.C. Hathaway was very active both um, in Western New York, anti-slavery, all kinds of organizing. He actually became the president pro tem of the first women's rights convention in Worcester, Massachusetts too. And they hosted and have letters with Douglas. One of the most interesting and this hard to believe stories is Mary and Emily Edmondson, who um, William Chaplin, who was a white anti-slavery organizer that had been very active in this area, including in the Farmington area, moved to Washington, DC, and began to organize um, escape escapes of people enslaved in Washington, D.C. And he had this grand plan, April 1848. He hired a boat, a ship, the Pearl. It had, there was only going to be like a handful of people escaping on the Pearl, but people heard about it. Seventy-seven enslaved people ended up on that ship. Mm. Unfortunately, it got becalmed in Chesapeake Bay. They were overtaken, captured. Everyone was sold back into slavery, including Mary and Emily Edmondson, 
who were sent to the New Orleans slave market to be concubines, probably, because they were so young and beautiful. They were like 13 and 15. And um, there was a yellow fever epidemic, so they were sent back to Richmond, Virginia, because the slave owner didn't want to lose them, his investment. Um, their dad came north and raised money in churches and $2,250 sent it to William Chaplin and said, buy my daughters out of slavery, which he did. Until we started the Farmington Project, we didn't realize that they came directly to Farmington immediately. There were five Quaker women, they were Orthodox Quaker women actually, who set up a school for the Edmondson sisters. The building is still standing. The home of the teacher is still standing, which is right next door. We have a program on October 7th at the Macedon Academy, which is a gorgeous 1852 Greek Revival building. It's um, 2 o'clock, and Mary Kay Ricks is a lawyer in DC who's written a book about them. She's going to come and talk to us. Myrtilla Minor from Madison County heard about the Edmondson sisters and came to Farmington to kind of look and see, well, how's this working? She went to Douglas and he, he records, I thought she was too frail and too young and didn't know what she was doing, she'll never make it. But she went to Washington, D.C., set up a school to help teach black kids to become teachers. She got ill in 1857 and sent out word and said, I have to stop unless someone can help. Emily Holland said, well, here I am. She went to Washington and worked for her, and then that started the whole uh, list that you have there of her working with Freedmen schools. William Wells Brown, who was the first African-American playwright, he was a historian, uh, he wrote three autobiographies, I think. He was an extremely effective lecturer. He went to England and spent a lot of time but he came to Farmington in the 1840s where he wrote his first autobiography and J.C. Hathaway wrote the introduction to it. Um, there's a physical evidence of people who escaped from slavery in Farmington. This is the gravestone of Selby Howard, his wife Harriet's next to him, buried next to him, but the gravestone is all deteriorated. But his epitaph says, born a slave, lived a free man, died in the Lord. And we know where he lived, his house burned. Then he moved to a small house, which Dave has actually discovered is on his property, uh, the foundations of it, the archaeological recommendations. So. And then the third major movement that they were really active with was women's rights, as they were in Sherwood as well. Everyone thinks of Elizabeth Cady Stanton as being identified with the Seneca Falls Women's Rights Convention, which she was, she was her brain's child. But if it hadn't been for Quaker women in that area who helped organize it, nothing would have happened. I mean, they're the ones who wrote letters and said, please come. They're the ones who um, organized places to stay. They're the ones who acted as ushers helping people get down. They're the ones who actually, the McClintock family helped write the <coughs> Declaration of Sentiments. Um, the inspiration, as Stanton would always say, for that meeting was, in fact, Lucretia Mott, who came to Farmington every summer to Genesee early meetings of friends. And her, um, she said, Christians need to be known more by their likeness to Christ than by their ideas about what Christ was. <laughs> um, and Stanton went on Friday morning, 10 o'clock, she wrote him, but she took the trains to Waterloo to this house which was the home of Thomas and Mary Ann McClintock and their five kids. Thomas McClintock had been clerk of Genesee Yearly Meeting at Farmington. He left because he decided to commit his life to um, abolition and the American Anti-Slavery Society. Larry, were you? Yeah, uh, you had the picture of Carol Faulkner there. What was that about? Oh, Carol, Carol has written the last best biography of Lucretia Mott. I have. So we have a uh, an award we give, we've only given it three times, I think, right? It's called Carrying on the Vision from people who really understand or try to interpret what was happening. And Carol, she didn't get a uh, Carrying on the Vision award, but we thought she did that. So, <laughs> yeah. And that's why you saw David Anderson and Peter and Jeanette uh, Jemison, too, their pictures. 
This is now part of Women's Rights National Historical Park, and you can see that it's open to the public. About a third of the signers of the Seneca Falls Declaration of Sentiments, and in, in that McClintock house, they were saying, uh, Stanton, remember, she said, oh, we took up peace society, temperance society, anti-slavery society um, outlines. None of them seemed, all of them seemed too tame and pacific for a rebellion such as the world has never seen. <laughs> and then she said, and then someone took one of the party, so I think it's one of the McClintocks who were there, took up the Declaration of Independence. And immediately they knew that's exactly what they wanted to say, except saying instead of all men are created equal, they wanted to say all men and women are created equal. So instead of 17 grievances against King George, which if you read today, they are so boring. If you read 17 grievances of women against the patriarchal establishment, most of which were still, all of which I think we're still dealing with today oh, yeah. about equality in politics and voting, uh, jobs, family, religion, um, schools and education. It's all, it feels like it leaps off the page and you say that's still what we're dish dealing mm -hmm. with. So it's really kind of it's exciting. And about a third of the signers were Quakers most of them affiliated with Farmington Quaker Meeting. And these are some of their pictures. Um, these Quakers at Farmington, and the same thing happened in Sherwood too, um, not all Quakers really wanted to work with the world's people. They were really upset with these reformers who wanted to come in, and I can understand it, abolitionists kind of instead of uh, a nice quiet meeting out of which someone speaks out of his silence and sort of, you know, 30 seconds of something related to scripture, Jacob Ferris would get in there and he'd start haranguing people about abolitionism and why it's totally against everything we believe, why we need to get out there and work. A lot of these Quakers were saying, I don't know, this isn't right I don't, for a Quaker meeting. And so the meeting in Farmington split apart in June 1848. Half the annual meeting just walked out, and they formed a separate meeting, which we'll talk about in a minute. Um, Quakers in Sherwood were way ahead of anybody else. I think there were five different Quaker meetings in Sherwood. <laughs> Keep splitting apart, splitting apart. And none of them, of course, talked to each other. So I, it must have been quite a uh, a dramatic place to be living. Um, in June 1848, Quakers, half of them, walked out and they formed a new yearly meeting of Friends, which was called the Congregational Friends. Mm -hmm. They were dedicated to universal equality, to philanthropy and positive good in the world, and they, they call it practical righteousness, to ongoing <coughs> revelation. We don't have to read the Bible to know what we're supposed to do. We how do we know which parts of the Bible we're supposed to read? We still have um, the Spirit speaking to us to help us understand the world today. Um, and one of the things they did was organize not separate meetings for men and women, but for um, everybody was to meet together into one meeting. And this immediate response to divine requiring, as opposed to relying on the Bible as the word of God, I, and I think all three of these points really emerged in the early 20th century in Friends General Conference. It's kind of what unprogrammed Friends today might really feel comfortable with. In 1854, they published uh, an invitation to the annual meeting in Frederick Douglass's North Star, and they said this, the platform is broad and comprehensive, the most perfect liberty of conscience, an assembly in which Christians, Jews, Mohammedans, and pagans, by which they meant traditional Seneca people, men and women of all names and no name, you didn't have to believe any particular thing, may labor together for the promotion of human welfare with no other law but the law of love. Elizabeth Cady Stanton was invited to give the keynote address at the organizational meeting, October 6, 1848. 
And she did, and then she passed around a petition for women's suffrage. And by 1852, she's reporting to Martha Wright, who's Lucretia Mott's sister, mm -hmm. that she can, she says, I've heard a rumor that I joined the Episcopal Church. I feel as if I've been accused of petty larceny. <laughs> <laughs> my ideas about women let me join, my ideas about religion certainly wouldn't. I consider myself a member of the Congregational Friends. And so she was going to those annual meetings regularly. At the end of the meeting, a Quaker is from Waterloo, uh, the town of Junius got out Henry Bunnell. Everybody's quiet and stands thinking, oh, they didn't like it, you know, but Quakers are quiet. Henry Bunnell gets up and he says, and, and the, the account says in a sing-song voice, if a hen can crawl, let her crawl. <laughs> and everyone laughed. And he came up afterwards and he said, I didn't mean to raise the laugh on thee. I just meant if a woman can do something and she wants to, she should do it. Uh, Susan B. Anthony came from Quaker background, and a lot of her relatives lived in the Farmington area. When she was accused of voting, which she actually did, and about to face trial in the Canandaigua Courthouse, uh, she came to places in every town, first in Monroe County, and then they changed the venue to uh, Ontario County every town in Ontario County, and she did speak in Farmington uh, at the Orthodox Friends Meeting House in uh, June 1873. Oh, I, this is always kind of fun. In upstate, upstate New York's voted Republican since 1856. They're Lincoln Republicans, a lot of them. They kind of haven't connected things that's changed, but so I always think, you know, like she says to Stan, she says, I've positively gone and on it, voted the Republican ticket straight. So, <laughs> so what happened to this building? <laughs> Such an important site of equal rights should have turned into the building that you saw in the early part of this talk. Well, lots of people left. Quakers, like everyone else, they went to cities, they went farther west, and there just weren't people left. Like Sherwood doesn't have any Quaker meeting at all today. Um, but the remnants of the Hicksites tried to keep it up. In 1873, there was a huge holiness revival in Farmington. The accounts say 6,000 people came. And it ended up really strengthening the Orthodox friends. And suddenly, their old log meeting house from 1806 burned. I don't know what happened to it. They built this beautiful new one, which is still standing. It looks a lot like the Poplar Ridge Meeting House, which you know today. Um, by 1927, there were no more Hicksites to keep this building up. So they sold it to a guy named John Van Lair, who turned it into a barn. And I show this picture because he took out every other window. There were six windows across. Took out every other one. We don't know why. But he saved them all. He stacked them up inside. So we still have uh -huh. pieces of the very deteriorated windows and frames. And then he, he raised the lower floor up to a second floor. So we still have the original first floor, but it's now the second floor. Um, and he took out all the dividers, which are beautiful uh, wood, uh, probably cherry and maple ones. And he made a little room on the second floor. So the architects estimate we probably got 85 to 90 percent of the original pieces left. They're just not in the right places. You know, the, those old pickup stick things we used to do as kids. Um, and then by the early 21st century, this is what the building looked like. Part of the reason was a lady ran her car into the post and then it fell down, and then the whole bay fell off and the roof as you can see is really needs work it wasn't surprising that the farmington town board said this building has to go so the owner that and this is part of why this part's gone brought his little backhoe and started ripping off the walls and the window there was a nice window there that's totally gone because he thought he had to tear it down um, and that's the point when a few local people got together and said, no, no, no. And I think we went to every town board for the first year to uh, plead that this building be 
capped and we did everything we could to stabilize it with wires and Dave was out there checking it every week and I live in Fulton so it's not close and I call Helen Kirker and I said, Helen, is it still standing? And she said, yeah, yeah, okay. <laughs> um, and we did get a lot of support and help from people who really appreciated the historical importance of this building. Um, and we developed some clear guidelines that helped us keep our focus in spite of what looked like a disastrous or almost impossible project. We have a really nice mission statement. We, we value the authenticity of that space. We look carefully at our audiences. We, we're working with how best to raise money and what to do to carry out our mission and what resources we need. This is our mission statement. We preserve, maintain, and interpret the 1816 Farmington Quaker Meeting House as a national site of conscious, a cornerstone of historic movements for equal rights, social justice, and peace, including rights for Native Americans, African Americans, and women, inviting visitors to explore issues of equality and justice in their own lives. Because none of us are in there because the past is past. We're in there because what people in the past have to say is so important for helping us to figure out what we're doing in the present and the future. And this site is unique. And no, there's no other place in the world that people can come and stand where Frederick Douglass or, or Elizabeth Cady Stanton did. And we think it really is so important in promoting, and I shouldn't necessarily say so well, but because Sherwood is another one that is so important in promoting equal rights for all people in the Finger Lakes region. We have all kinds of audiences. Most of them are white, most of them are local. But we try to appeal to uh, all different kinds of ages, to people of different backgrounds, uh, tourists as well as local people, to create a space where people can come and say, oh, I didn't know that, and not feel dumb and where they can say, what do you think about this, and not feel like people are saying, oh, you should have known that. Um, we've been very lucky to get a lot of funding from Humanities New York for, we've been doing like five to seven programs a year. Um, and because the space isn't amenable to having groups come in, we have turned lemons into lemonade, I guess, and have worked a lot with local groups, uh, Wood Library, uh, Sonnenberg Gardens, Granger Homestead, Ganondagan Historic Site, Aquaba, the Heritage Tourism Group in Rochester, who have helped hold our meetings. And then we can expand our audiences because they help promote it and publicize what we're doing. And they expand their audience because people who are interested in Farmington wouldn't otherwise necessarily go to the Granger Homestead. So it's really been a very effective um, way to do this. We also, besides our programs, our second big effort has been on restoration. We're working with John G. Wade Associates from Albany. This is some of them working early on. And we had to move the meeting house across the road. That was one of the biggest <laughs> issues because the town would not let us keep it in that place and have it open to the public because it seemed to attract a lot of car accidents people were getting into. So we said, OK. And we got a grant from the New York State Office uh, of Historic Preservation, and they helped us move it. And this is uh, Helen Kirker dressed in Quaker garb. And you know, some of you may know Barbara Blaisdell, who interprets Susan B. Anthony and um, Peter Jemison as a Seneca person on moving day. We had to rebuild that whole bay that had fallen off. It's 10 feet wide. And that was 2018. We've been lucky to have major donors. And these are some of them without whom we absolutely could not do this work. I don't know how you guys do it. You have a wonderful, amazing, uh, donor base. Um, we have another grant proposal into the Environmental Protection Fund this year. And we did get a grant from the Historic Preservation Fund um, the, from the National Park Service of almost half a million dollars. So we can match it with uh, state funds if we get it. So keep your fingers crossed, because I don't know how we can do this if we don't. 
So thanks to all these supporters, um, we're now ready for a full restoration, and Dave is going to tell you what we're doing right now. Do you, do you want to click that right hand turn? No, I'll have to do it. You want me to do it? Okay. Yeah. I push the buttons wrong. I can do that. <laughs> so I'm Dave Bruinix. I've been part of this project pretty much since the inception. Took a little while off because my son is a pretty good hockey goalie, so we lived a mm -hmm. travel hockey family. But as going through the slides, it's always it's like a timeline of my kid growing up. Yeah, that's so right. There's one picture where it shows a group of us holding signs with the meeting house in the background. He's about this tall, and he's my height now. Uh, when the building was being moved down the road, I tried to get the picture that made it look like he was carrying the building down the road. Oh, he wasn't. He was. <laughs> so, and, and Judy's PowerPoint, she cut me out of the picture. But I like that picture because it's got me, my son, and then my dad's closer to the building. Oh, I didn't see that. I was a uh, middle school teacher, and we always would get a poster from the state. And, you know, sometimes you look at them, but you just hang them up on the wall. And that poster was hanging on my classroom wall for, I'm going to say, a couple months before I ever actually looked at it. <laughs> and it was the picture that was on the slide a little while ago. So a lot of what I'm going to talk about is what we are doing moving forward, some of the things we've already done. And one of them is our Walk of Freedom Trail Serenity Peace Park. So my mother, who's not in any of these pictures. Yes, she is. She's coming up. Right, but not this one. Okay. Yeah. My mother had a dream, vision, that she would like to see a nature trail along the property. And when it was discussed at the board meeting, I was just coming back from Travel Hockey Land, so I sat quietly at the meetings. And when the meeting was over, I went over to the woods and looked around and huh, I can do this. And so there was actually a deer trail that ran down along the property area. And unfortunately, we've lost a lot of our ash trees to the Emerald Ash Borer. And I was able to take my old tractor with the bucket and didn't really take any live trees out and build about a quarter mile. This is my trusty 1964 International Harvester 460. I get a lot of work out of that. A friend of mine is a uh, forest and shade tree contractor. And any of the guys in the tree business, they have a lot of wood chips. And if you ever say, hey, could I have some wood chips? They'll bring you more than you ever want. <laughs> but I used every bit of what they gave me. And the entire trail, as you can see in through here and over and through there, we were able to wood chip the entire thing to make it a little more walkable, comfortable. I, uh, there's my mom and dad. Which ones is your mom? This is my mom. That's my friend Robin. Yeah. <laughs> and that's my dad. And that looks like Lyle. So, some of the other things on the trail, once we got going with it, it's about a quarter mile long, and at the very far end of it is a larger gathering area. If you ever have had worked in a farm field with a lot of rocks. You pick the rocks out of the field and you set them in the hedgerow. Mm -hmm. Well, I built the trail along the perimeter of, along the hedgerow. So every once in a while I'd come into a big pile of rocks. Well, I had a couple choices, one rock at a time and throw them, or just come in with the bucket on the tractor and push them out of my way. So you know what I did. Mm -hmm. What it ended up doing was, as the trail travels along, there were little peninsulas that stuck out. And so I ended up leveling them off a little bit, and we put the wood chips there. And ended up, when you're, this isn't into the main forest, this is more of the new growth. But on those peninsulas, you're looking into a little bit older forest with wetlands, any variety of woodland fauna that you would like to see, flora. It, it's very nice. It's a place to relax, to contemplate, to sit and think. And so 
we needed some benches. And we found Eagle Scouts. And so what we ended up with was two different sets of benches. In a quarter mile trail, we have nine benches. Uh, one boy built six of them. Those sit along at each of the peninsulas. They're a nice little wooden bench and you can sit and contemplate or relax. You can only pick one per bench though. That's kind of a rule. <laughs> and then the next set of benches and these ones, Owen Binder was the Eagle Scouts name. And those we took and did a blueprint based off our original pews in the meeting house and he built pressure treated lumber versions of those so that we could keep them outside in the area. And the third Eagle Scout to work on this project, what he built were the mounting hardware for the signs. We have eight signs with quotes from African Americans, women, Native Americans, and Quakers. They're on a two by three foot. It's the same material, the substrate and the vinyl that you use on road signs. So it'll be pretty durable. That's my wife. Previous slide. Yeah. <laughs> uh, what else are we doing? As much as we possibly can. We have a lot of different programs. Uh, Judy covered them pretty well. This is from our program on Quaker Day earlier this June, where Jeanette Jemison spoke on guiding young Native children to a better future. Mm. In, through nature. Through nature, yes. Uh, go ahead. Dave, we, how, how much property do you have? It's about five acres, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, it was given to us by Farmington Friends. It well, was really nice. We otherwise could not have done this at all. It's right across the road from the f current Farming to Friends meeting. I like this picture. Uh, from what we can see, this is actually probably from a 4th of July celebration with some of the other pictures that no, go it's on. Quaker Days. I is think. It, this is Quaker Days? because it, it matches up. With, but I like the naughty kids. Oh. <laughs> you know, that might have been me at that time. Uh, go ahead. Oh, well, the other slide it does show that we did win a very nice grant from National Park Service. Yeah. 483,000. 727, but who's counting? Right, exactly. <laughs> and we're able to use that as a matching grant for moving forward, which is very nice. If you are familiar with the current Quaker Meeting House, the 1876, that is right here. In the cemetery right in back of it. This is where we will be. That's where we are. Parking lot, the nature trail runs down and through there. Yeah, we want to talk to you guys about your parking lot. It's beautiful. It's exactly what we need. In the bottom end of the property, we'd like to put a carriage house. Uh, they would have had one. You know, got to park the horses and the carriages somewhere. The only thing close to an image of what we have is a rooftop in the background of one of the photos. But I mean, it's just like from here up. Can't really get much on it. So we look at just a variety of different carriage houses. There doesn't seem to be a set pattern. There's books on carriage houses at Quaker meetings that just show 75 different versions. So see where that goes. We needed some electricity. It's uh, hard to do public speaking with a generator right behind you. Mm -hmm. I'm usually very loud. I'm trying to be a little quieter because of the size of the room today. But my middle school teacher keeps getting louder. So this is my buddy Jerry. We've been friends since we were little kids. He retired as an electrician. I had him come over. What do we got to do to actually do this? And he made up a materials list of what we would need. He said he would donate his time. And before, well, years ago, I was a track and cross country coach at Victor Schools. 
and I coached a girl named Kristen Pellerick. And her father is the, one of the project engineers for O'Connell Electric Company. So I called him and said, what would it take to get you guys to donate all these materials? He said, you just got to ask. <laughs> and it was during the COVID shortage on a lot of the materials. So they, because what we needed would be leftovers. They're the largest electrical contractor in the state. What we needed was going to be leftovers from other jobs, but they were in such a crunch for inventory, they weren't able to fulfill our needs completely out of what they had. So they called Graybar Electric, their biggest supplier, and said, we've committed to donating this stuff, but we don't have it all, so you're going to give them the rest. <laughs> and they did. Well, it, was, it was about $20,000 worth of materials. Fabulous. It was there. Uh, the committee building, it, it, it's very interesting. I took this photograph and printed it out, and I went over to the meeting house and I measured everything I could possibly think of and put the numbers on it, and I put it on Instagram and asked people to put out their sense of what size they thought the building was. And it was really interesting the way people came up with numbers. Some people had this building bigger than this building, <laughs> which I was pretty sure wasn't right. Uh, still not totally sure what it is, but there's evidence that this house, that when Jack Van Lair took the meeting house and moved it down the hill to become a potato barn, he gave it to his two daughters, Aurelia and Phyllis Van Lair, and they converted it into their home which was the meeting house would have been just behind it in its original location. I knew Aurelia and Phyllis when I was little and they always remembered me, reminded me of, I can't remember their name, but there were two sisters on the Waltons and they made the recipe, if, you're, if you remember them. But these, they were those ladies personified. They were so funny, so sweet, but that house actually burned down in 1989. So it doesn't exist anymore, but we have I went and dug through the town records and got footprint sizes, and it's, it's pretty close to what we thought. We're looking at geothermal. We explored yours pretty intensely when we were here last time to visit, just to get a sense of, for me, how big the equipment inside the building was, to try to figure out where we would actually put it. Uh, parking lot and walkway, patio. We have now have four completed Eagle Scout projects on our site. Uh, the sign that we worked with, a friend of mine from high school owns Ewing Graphics. If you've ever seen a Wegmans truck, he does all the Wegmans trailers and things like this. And I went and I asked him about some of the signage, if he would help us with that. The trail signs, I forget what they ended up costing us for eight signs. He said he'd have to do it at cost. He wasn't going to do it on him to us. I think they were about seven bucks each. Uh, I don't think it was even cost because you know that's not going to cover the labor, the materials. And our we keep showing an image of Helen Kirker standing next to a sign, the lady in the Quaker outfit. That was an Eagle Scout project sign, but the letters themselves didn't hold up to the weather. So what Tom did is the sign that I was standing next to in the last picture. He made us new versions of. So they should hold up. Uh, Quaker days. It's something that we want to keep doing in June moving forward. We try to have a variety of different activities at it from kids activities. Uh, we've had different speakers. Judy at one. That's the picture I was just talking about. Those letters were very thick and as soon as a little water got into them, they exploded. <laughs> and they got really, really thick and then thinner. Uh, that's the building before we put the addition back on, not addition, but other end. Thanks. <laughs> Does anyone have any questions about anything for either of us? I do. So the meeting house, if I understood you right, was moved when it became a potato barn and then moved again, so it's been moved twice? Yes. It's in its third location. 
Oh, hey. It, uh, he moved it 300 plus feet the first time, which it doesn't seem to make a lot of sense and until you look at where it was in relation to his potato fields. Because to pick up a 40 by 60 plus building and move it 300 feet, but it was on top of a hill. And when he's doing it, he's still working with draft horses, maybe early tractors, and acres and acres of muckland with potatoes. I grow some potatoes and nothing like what he did. It was worth the effort to have the barn at the end of the mucklands. We do have Facebook, website, and Instagram, so feel free to follow us. All right. Mm -hmm. Now sure. that exterior looks like plywood. It's plywood on it now. The exterior is it's, T, it's T111 siding, okay. yeah, which is going to come off. It's, it's just to protect the right. yeah, framing structure. Yeah. So right. what, what does it look like on the inside at this point? Oh, we should have a picture. Rustic? <laughs> oh, yeah. That's good. So it's just uh, dirt floor. Dirt floor, beams, and posts. Beams and posts. Mm -hmm. uh, is there a floor for the second floor? Yes. Yes, there is, because the floor for the second floor used to be the first floor, mm -hmm. but Jack Van Laren raised it up. I had a guy over yesterday look at, to identify some wood species on some various parts, and he was so excited about the joinery to put the wood floor together and how perfectly whoever cut the beach to fit into the chestnut crossboards. And he said, when you guys get to do that, if there's any of them that need to be done, can you please let me do the work? Oh, wow. <laughs> I'm like, okay. <laughs> <laughs> so, and you didn't know it when you spoke, but he, looking at our dividing walls, we looked at the grain pretty closely, and it looks like they're probably chestnut, actually. Oh, really? Yeah, it's Yep. And chestnut has uh, what they call rays. You know, you have your cross grain, and then it'll have like little beams coming in, and it looks a lot like oak. With oak, the rays will touch the cross grains, but with chestnut, they don't quite make it. And you have to look around and move so you get the reflection of the rays and that. Once you learn what it looks like, and you have both types to compare it to. So, oh, yeah. One of the things we're thinking about, there is, as you probably have discovered too, there's a tremendous need for people who know how to do these traditional trades and preservation trades. So we've been working with, it's called the HOPE Project, his hands-on preservation experience with the National Trust for Historic Preservation and the Preservation League of New York State. We're hoping we can leverage some of the funding we have to do this work to incorporate some workshops for kids or other people interested in learning trades. And for us, one of the big ones is, is windows, because we have so many windows that either need to be redone or new ones made. And plaster, and Dave, my, my new motto is, if you need something, ask Dave first, because he knows all these people. You want to tell him about your plaster guy? <laughs> Michael Doobie. He is mid-70s, so interesting. I called him and asked him if he would come over and look at the building. He says, oh, I've already looked at it. I'm like, when? He said, oh, my wife loved that building, so we used to sneak in it. <laughs> <laughs> but he, he came along and he, you know, a lot of the plaster's down, so he'd pop open a little piece and he'd show me the horse hairs that are within it. and. He is mostly retired now. I mean, when you're in your 70s, that's okay. Uh, no, it isn't because we need him. <laughs> but he said he would be more than willing to bid on our project when the time came and he will take on apprentices mm -hmm. so that they can learn the trade and advance it forward. Mm -hmm. And I've spoken with a couple other uh, preservation plasterers and they're all interested in sharing the trade. So that other people can learn how to do it. And you've also spoken with a woman who has horses. She's saving her horse hair for us. There are several groups saving the horse hair. The Finger Lakes Draft Horse Club. All of you that have horses. Yes. Yeah, mane and tail. Yeah, yeah. I'm we need it. I had my eyes on that a while ago. <laughs> that makes some nice plaster filling. <laughs> the. Uh, 
Yeah, the Finger Lakes Draft Horse Club, they're saving it for us. I've learned not to ask people with Arabians that show them because apparently if you show Arabians, you buy extra hair and put a weave oh. into their tails. <laughs> so oh, they're man. not going to give us really? that. Yeah. Uh, Larry had a question too. Yeah, uh, Judy, I, I was interested in, um, you said that the Orthodox meetings were oriented and their architecture was different. Can you, um, what do you know about that? Oh, actually, quite a lot. Uh, because, because, as you probably know, there most of them turned into program meetings. So there is a minister who might say a few words. There's a choir. There's a Bible reading. It's like a traditional Protestant church. So if you're if you have somebody speaking up front, then everybody often faces the front. Yeah. So they made the like the Poplar Ridge one. It's the gable into the street model. And yeah. the Farmington one in 1876 is like that too, rather than the two front door one with the broadside to the street that traditional meetings were. So instead of the, um, so more of a lecture hall yeah. type mm -hmm. format mm -hmm. uh, where, you, where your speaker is at the narrow head, right. instead of the uh, New England meeting house where you're, um, where's the broad, like you say, the broadside. Mm -hmm. yeah. There's one also, I think it's now being used as an Episcopal church, actually. There's one like the, the Brocade one to the street and Skinny Atlas. There's several, but you can tell immediately by looking at them when they about when they were built before the Civil War or after, whether mm -hmm. they were Hicksite or, or are Orthodox. Sure. Do you know how the uh, interior seating was arranged in the broadside um, meetings? Yeah, they seem to be facing the fa the there uh, along one side was what they call the facing bench, and it would have been step benches usually okay. three up the side for the ministers and elders. So all the rest of us would be sitting facing the facing bench, okay. not not in a circle as many Quaker meetings are today. So it would be on a kind of almost more like a sports arena that you'd have the the main people up on the bleachers and mm -hmm. the the others down on the floor, mm -hmm. so to speak. Right. Interesting. And uh, for the meetings for business, there'd be women on one side and men on the other side. We don't actually know which side was which. So if you have any clues, you've got one, and this is a parallel to it, the North Street Meeting House mm -hmm. here. And it's got the gable into the street, It's and it's brick, so it's kind of patterned after Philadelphia friends. Um, and yeah. Well, thank you so much, and do come and visit. Oh, one, yeah. more I just have one comment. I, I presume you brought these for your presentation we did. today. Would it be possible to for those to stay here for a couple of weeks, so those of us who live in the neighborhood come and visit? Sure. There's a lot of information on the East End. Uh, but I guess we'd have to discuss how or to if make If you have the, another set or... No, it's just the one they're, set. They're beautifully done. We don't need no. it in the next couple weeks. No, I was going to say, I'll, I'll leave you guys information to get hold of me, and if nothing okay. else, okay. We, some, we can meet in the middle or otherwise. All right. Absolutely. Information also on your website? Yes. Stuff. Yep. A lot of it is. We have a ton of stuff on the website, and we're redoing our website. So we our website. Does anyone else want a thing with a website on? Uh, normally, we um, have regular, like monthly newsletters. So if you want to be on that, there's a way you can subscribe. We haven't done it in the last couple of months because we're trying to move to a new design. So our website guy right now has been working 17-hour shifts, seven yeah. days a week, mm -hmm. and he has just had a baby. Oh, one and a half year old and a brand new baby. Oh. So he's a little busy. <laughs> Thank uh, you all for coming today. It's wonderful.